Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Donna Prosser. I am the Chief Clinical Officer here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Um, again, my apologies for us getting started late. Uh, this actually is part two of our social disparities webinar that we did back in June. Uh, and at that time, what we were focusing on was the effect of COVID-19 on disparate populations, very specifically in Chicago, Illinois. If you haven't seen that and, you are, uh, and you'd like to go back and view that, you can see that on our YouTube channel. Um, I've got the long link here, but you can access it easily through the webinar page on the Patient Safety Movement website. But just to reiterate um, what the key points were in this last in, in, in the last uh, webinar that we did, we talked a lot about how structural racism has significantly impacted uh, communities of color. And looking at this list of inadequate poverty, poor nutrition, um, inadequate education, significantly lower life expectancies, and a much much higher prevalence of comorbidities, I'm sure then that, uh, that that's not surprising that this created the conditions for the severe level of illness and deaths from COVID that we saw in these populations early in the pandemic and still now. Um, you know, Pat Merriweather, one of our panelists brought up that the elderly are another disparate population, um, often forgotten in nursing homes and rehabilitation centers and also disproportionately affected by COVID. Um, and, um, and we also spoke about the safety net hospitals that serve these communities who didn't receive much of the CARES Act funding and, 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 and sustained some pretty significant financial losses because of COVID. Uh, so, but the, the, the message last time uh, that I heard loud and clear was that achieving health equity is going to be very hard work, but it, it has to be done. And we unfortunately had uh, run out of time last time to talk much about what we need to do about this. Uh, this is not an easy solution. So we have, um, we have uh, um, a, set our panelists back today to talk about what we need to do to improve this. So um, we, our same panelists from last time are here joining us. So we've got Dr. Ron Wyatt, Dr. Marcus Robinson, Dr. Daria Terrell, and Pat Merriweather. Um, and I'd love for, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and, um, and for the remainder of this conversation, we're just gonna have a panel discussion. So I'd love for our panelists to introduce themselves and I'd like to start with Ron Wyatt. Dr. Wyatt, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, hi, uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, good to see you again and thank you, Donna and Kaylee and Patient Safety Movement. So by training, uh, I'm an internist, practiced for about 25 years, mostly in St. Louis and here in North Alabama where I am this morning. Grew up in the uh, Alabama Black Belt, uh, small town born in Selma. And I would say that the work of disparities uh, has been a lifelong um, journey for me. It's the reason I went into healthcare in the first place and that journey uh, continues. So thank you. I muted myself by, okay. And uh, Marcus, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Marcus Robinson, a uh, um, psychologist by training and I've uh, been uh, working in the community uh, 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 development field for over 30 years, and um, I've been uh, served on the boards of Spectrum Health, uh, Lakeland Health, Unity uh, out of Michigan, Unity Health uh, in New York, and uh, currently here in my neighborhood in Inglewood, Chicago, um, on the patient uh, advisory board at uh, St. Bernard um, Hospital. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us again. And Pat, good morning. Tell us a bit about you yourself. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I'm Pam Merriweather Argus, and I'm with Project Patient Care. Prior to Project Patient Care, and it is an advocacy organization uh, for patients, families, caregivers, in bringing the voice of the patient and resident to the forefront. Uh, but prior to that, I worked for the Illinois Hospital Association and also the Quality Improvement Organization. Uh, both organizations working on not only um, the equity issue, but also uh, across the continuum of care, because that's oftentimes we focus on hospitals, but as we know, care has shifted to the community level, to the outpatient level. And I also serve on a number of hospital boards, including uh, one uh, in Marcus's neighborhood in Englewood, at St. Bernard Hospital. Wonderful. Well, welcome again to everyone. I know that uh, Dr. Daria Terrell is working on getting on. So Kaylee, just 
if you just let us know when she's able to join and then we will uh, hear from her as well. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. We have lots of questions for you all today. Um, and I'd love to start first with Ron. Um, Ron, it, since our last webinar, you had a personal experience that illustrated exactly what we're talking about here today and why this is so important. I'd love for you to share that story with us and some insights that you've learned. Sure, uh, and, and thanks for asking the question. And I'll add on some to some developments from that story as I go, and I'll try to be as concise as possible. Uh, about two and a half months ago, my brother was diagnosed with a significant medical illness uh, that will require radiation treatment, chemotherapy, and a bone marrow transplant. Uh, after a couple of days of not feeling well, um, his wife, who had had a ruptured cerebral aneurysm about two years ago, um, this, uh, decided to take him to a hospital there in Northern Virginia and he was admitted with septic shock and put in the ICU. Now, I'm gonna back up and, and tell you a bit about um, my brother who's a couple years older. He is a lifelong uh, public servant, veteran of the Vietnam era. Um, he is a um, managing supervisor for a large federal government agency uh, that I think most of us uh, know and, and Fear. <laughs> so, um, uh, but the, about him, he is a consummate professional person, impeccable in his dress, um, down to the point that if he gets a nick on a pair of shoes, he won't wear them anymore. And so I get these really nice shoes uh, that he decides not to wear. He sends his shirts and blue jeans even to get them starched. Um, so after um, a day in the ICU when he was on leave fed, which for people that don't know, it was there to keep his blood pressure up. Uh, apparently he had gone into acute renal failure. I talked with the care team on two days um, back to back. Uh, the, the conversations were mostly demeaning to me uh, and the data that I was given was totally misleading. So for example, uh, the hospitalist told me that his renal function had improved and I asked for his creatinine and, and it was actually higher than it was the day before. So when I said, well, how could this be an improvement when it's worse than the day before? And, and he went into an explanation of how that was better. And finally, um, you know, he, he gave up on that. And I said, well, that, there's nothing about this is better. Uh, the next day, a uh, nurse practitioner uh, talked with, with me who I would say had better grasp of the data uh, but still, what I experienced was a disconnect between the medical interventions and the person that was in the bed uh, with uh, a very low blood pressure and acute renal failure who had been told um, that he would probably face temporary dialysis. Uh, uh, about three days later, he was, to me, inexplicably transferred to a, a medical surgical unit. Uh, I made sure that his wife knew that he needed to speak with Pharmacy, social services, care coordination, uh, care management, uh, uh, all of the things that he would need to know um, before he was discharged home. Now, again, this is a, a person who's never been in a hospital overnight as a patient in his life. The next day, he was discharged home. Uh, when my sister-in-law picked him up um, from the hospital and, and understand in the midst of COVID, uh, she could not visit him as an inpatient. He was brought to the to the reception area to be picked up by her uh, in a wheelchair. When she picked him up, he broke down in tears. Uh, she described him as quote unquote filthy. Uh, and this again, a person who prided himself in his appearance. Uh, during that hospitalization again, nor he or the family met with any of the teams that I just described. Uh, they did not do any type of home assessment they didn't know anything about her functional uh, inabilities or that he had to climb. Both of them had to climb two uh, flights of stairs. Uh, he worked primarily at a lower level at home, but his, the bedroom was two flights of stairs up. There was no inquiry about what kind of home setting are you going into. So uh, about a week after I filed a concern, complaint and grievance with a hospital, I, I was able to speak to the head of hospital medicine. And I went through this same story that, that I shared with you, 
but he, he started out um, with a, a, a statement that I, I think um, demonstrates um, what happened to my brother. And what happened to him was that his dignity was taken. Uh, he was not shown compassion. Uh, he was not respected. Uh, and back to your, your uh, point, Donna, this is, this is hard work, but this is heart work. And he did not receive the heart work. Uh, that and the hard work doesn't hard work doesn't substitute for hard work. So when I when I talk with the hospitalist, this is how he started the statement. Well, you know when these folks come in, and I said, wait a second, what do you mean by these folks? And, and he said, well, you know what I mean. You're internist. I said, no, I don't. What I know is you had a human being that happened to be my brother in septic shock. And I went through this, this same series of events. So I said, so we need to back up. Uh, and, and we're not going to talk about any human being as, as these folks, whoever these folks are. Um, and, and through the conversation, uh, he, he began, after some of the defensiveness began to fade, not all of it, um, he said, well, I'm learning from this as I talk to you. And, and you know, uh, he could have learned from my brother and, and my sister-in-law when he was there, if they had met with them. Uh, you know, I spent the next week uh, going over what a renal diet was because um, they didn't go over renal diet for a person who was facing uh, temporary dialysis. So, so she, was, she took him home and was giving him the same foods that he had been taking before, high potassium foods and a person who's in acute renal failure. No one talked to her about diet when I talked to the hospitalist, uh, chief hospital of medicine. He even said to me, well, you know, we have a dietitian, but we don't have a nutritionist. So I said, well, you know, you're, you're in a very large healthcare system, one of the more large healthcare systems in this country. You're going to tell me that you have people in acute renal failure that don't have access to a nutritionist, that he had a reaction to uh, a biologic and no one discussed with him the dosage or, or what that biologic was doing to him. None of that took place. He never met with the pharmacist or a care team. So I'm going to pause there because I think in many ways it does demonstrate the, the disparity or as W.E.B. Dwells talked about, this um, um, passive indifference to, to, to people. And it doesn't matter in his case. He has, he has not one but two master's degrees, uh, you know, a professional person. So that doesn't matter. And the data says for, for black, indigenous, and people of color, it doesn't matter what your, your educational background is. It doesn't matter what your income is. There's something different about the, those interactions that impact care. And what my, what my brother said, and I shared this with the hospitalist, is when he left and in tears, his wife said, I might as well be dead because of the way he was treated when he was in the hospital. And, and, and again, this is something I know directly about because it's my brother and I experienced it, but this happens every day. And this happened every day for decades and generations. And, and we're to this inflection point where, where we, what we talk about today, we've got to say, we have to stop this. We have to do hard work. We have to respect people. We have to show compassion. We have to be empathetic. We cannot rip a person's dignity from them because then they, they're left feeling with this internalized idea that I might as well be dead. So I'll, I'll stop there. Wow, Ron, thank you so much for sharing that very powerful story and you know, sets the tone for exactly why we're having this conversation today. So thank you very much. Um, we, um, we have been able to get Dr. Daria Terrell on with us on the panel. So good morning, Daria. So, so sorry for the, the, uh, the technical difficulties. We're, Still getting texts that Zoom is having all kinds of issues, so my apologies there. Um, no. But if you, <laughs> yeah, if you would, uh, would you introduce yourself for for the audience, please? Good morning, everyone. Sorry for the delay in joining you. Um, as Donna said, tech issues uh, got the best of me this morning. But I am Dr. Daria Brooks Terrell. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and I am the medical director of clinical programming and health outcomes at St. Bernard Hospital which is a safety net hospital in Chicago, Illinois. And I'm very happy to be here and a part of this discussion, this very important discussion this morning. Thanks for joining us. 
Well, my first question um, is to Ron. Ron, in our last webinar, we ended the webinar where you spoke about the three things that we have to do to achieve health equity, rectifying historical injustices, valuing everyone equally, and reallocating resources based upon need. Could you just briefly review those and um, and what you think that we, we need to Sure. So I'm going to say first and foremost, if I look at those three, all are critical. The most important one is we have to value people. That's most important. Doesn't matter how old you are, where you live, your education, your skin color, we have to value people. That black, indigenous, and people of color populations, LBGTQ populations, the elderly, this, the disabled have been devalued and in some cases have been dehumanized. And as the example I gave, then people become, uh, they internalize this devaluation of them as a person. And then we have this way of feeling comfortable about ourselves by saying, well, that person was non-adherent or they were non-compliant or they were combative or they were difficult or, or even the family doesn't care. Why should I? That's, that's the realness that goes on. So we have to learn that every human being has innate value. And, and if we can start there and, and see the humanity in, in the people that come to us seeking to trust us, and that gets into the historical injustice. There has been so much trust in, in black, indigenous, and people of color population that have been taken away. And, and, and in healthcare, I think we gotta understand, a part of racial healing is we're gonna to have to go back through some pain and wounds have to be cleaned out and, and, and sanitized and, and allowed to heal in an environment where healing is the top priority. So, so that trust started, I'm going to say, in 1619 or before. So, so, so pandemics for, for our populations started then. The disparity started then. The disparity started on slave ships and on, on plantations. It started when, when a black slave that ran away was labeled a dreptomaniac because you had to be crazy to try to run away from being a slave. It started with Marion Sims. Who, who, who was the father of gynecology that, that uh, operated on black women, some of whom he owned without anesthesia and became the father of modern gynecology. We can talk about the, the birth control contraceptive experiments that happened in Puerto Rico uh, with, with almost no informed consent. We all know the story of Henrietta Lacks and the HeLa cells uh, here in Alabama where I am, the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. All of these things began to line up for people to say, why should I trust you? And, and as we move through a pandemic and the urgency of a vaccine, that's a question that we need to start answering. Why are these populations gonna trust a vaccine when I don't even trust you to treat a sinus infection? So, so uh, we gotta understand that it's historical injustice and restore it to people. The next and, and a very difficult part of this uh, is we have to take resources that we have, that there's not many new resources. It's almost a zero sum game, but if we, but leadership at the executive and board level, we gotta say, we're gonna look at our resources and we're gonna reallocate resources. And that's scary for people because they hear redistribution of wealth. Well, you know, yes, we're gonna have to redistribute wealth and we need to redistribute resources where they are most needed, not where they're most wanted, but where they are most needed. And this is for both nonprofit, for, for systems, for-profit systems, government, federal health care systems, leadership has got to say, we, we have to put the resources where they're needed. There's no excuse for eight zip codes in New York City to not have no PPE in rich health care systems. There's no excuse that decisions have to be made about who gets put on a ventilator, that, that, that nurses and, and health care providers have to wear trash bags uh, to protect themselves in, in, in systems that have millions of dollars uh, in, in uh, resources that they distribute in an unequal way. So we need to understand who our populations are that are truly at risk and decide where those resources need to go. Understand who the people even that work for us that, that have to catch a train and a bus or walk or ride a bike that, that are making less than a living wage in our healthcare systems and take care of them. That's a leadership commitment. That is the hard work. So we have to value people 
as human beings. We got to understand the historical injustices that, that existed and, and frankly still exist. And then we got to make a commitment that we're going to put the resources where they are most needed and, and, and don't apologize for it. Uh, these are human beings and, and we're in a, in a life saving uh, uh, industry. And, and I would say bluntly to people that don't get this, you're doing more harm than good. Find something else to do for a living because you're only hurting people. And that's not what we're going to do from this point forward. We must not do it. We must commit to these three areas, uh, invest in them, incentivize them, and pay attention to them. So I'll pause there because I get carried away with it. So <laughs> <laughs> I love your passion, Ron. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, my next question is for Marcus. Uh, you know, uh, Ron articulated very well what hospitals and healthcare systems need to focus on, you know, from a leadership standpoint. Uh, but, you know, we, we also know that in those, in those organizations, there's a culture that's made up of individuals and folks from the community. What can the average person do, the average individual and the communities do to help support hospitals in this endeavor? Well, I think, first of all, thank you, Ron, for uh, sharing your personal story and uh, and giving context for this uh, this conversation and uh, and the passion that you bring to the, the very important ideas you just shared about the path forward for us. And Donna, thanks for such a wonderfully complex question. <laughs> so, You're welcome. I knew you could handle it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, so I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna start at the macro and see if I can't get down to something that makes some sense. Um, so ultimately, uh, we just simply have to come to uh, grips with the fact that oppressions drive the disparities and social determinants are all man-made. They're within our full control to address. You know, we can deal with these underlying issues that, that Ron is, uh, is pointing out. And, uh, and furthermore, we also need to understand that we are all complicit in that system that Ron is pointing out that would have that kind of outcome happen for, um, that would rob the dignity of a human, uh, from a human being in, in that way. And that we all live at the effect of that system, that oppression, and nobody gets a buy. Black, brown, blue, white, yellow, doesn't matter who you are, we're all uh, negatively affected by it. So we all have to do our own work to help rectify these injustices. And the work breaks down for me in three stages, really. Some, so the first stage, I heard Ron uh, kind of allude to it. We simply have to tell the truth to ourselves about the way things are and the way they have been so that we can see the evidences of the disparities and of the underlying drivers of these disparities so that we've got evidence to, with which, data with which to get some real work done. Um, and so, uh, uh, so the truth telling piece of it was super important um, so that we could understand how these oppressions, racism, sexism, genderism, you name it, is, is out there and is all, uh, uh, you know, having a, an impact on us. And once we find, so you got to do your own homework on that regard. And then there's the reconciliation piece. I think Ron spoke a little bit to this too. There's some making right that has to get done. And right now that means, <clears throat> that might mean uh, a reprioritize, uh, reprioritizing our, um, how we use dollars in um, healthcare writ large, and then expanding the healthcare uh, team, getting out of our silos kind of thing, you know, Hospitals are in a silo, um, public health people are in a silo, um, unaffiliated uh, practitioners are in their own, you know, little foxholes kind of thing. We all have to, you know, kind of uh, uh, do our own work. And so reconciliation is a, is a big piece of that work and, um, and we have to repair the breach. And keep in mind that this is a cultural journey. This is a journey towards cultural understanding and belonging. It's not a destination or a time point. So it's, you don't, we don't have to worry about trying to get someplace by a certain period of time. We just have to get on the way of speaking truth about the issues, gathering the data, and then making the reconciliations and the repatriations and the repayments and the whatever we have to do to reorganize in order to get this thing done. In your own, wherever you're at, because everybody's in a different lane, you know, so not everybody can do the top level work, but there is work we could do at the level of uh, uh, of an intake, 
at 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 the at the level of I'm coming to check your vitals this hour. I could do more than simply check off the numbers. I can actually have a human interaction with you that says, I see you, I value you, and I'm on this healing journey with you so that folks can, you know, you know, recover themselves in that way. And it's only when we do the truth telling and reconciliation that we can get on to healing. And, um, and I'm going to use uh, healing in the most broad sense of the word. I'm going to use trauma in a broad sense of the word because the oppressions that Ron is speaking to are traumas. And then when he talks about the historical patterns of how these things have come from 1690 uh, right through the 1800s, right into the day, these, these become epigenetic traumas that, that we actually experience in our bodies. That we're experiencing as, as much as I have skin color, I have the encoded trauma of my ancestors as well. And it's genealogical because it means that, you know, this, this stuff comes down, we all get told how to do this. The kid at kindergarten is getting the same, getting white kids, black kids, brown kids, white people, black people, brown people, indigenous people. We all get the same lessons about oppression. We're told where our place is in the thing. And, uh, and these are like family norms, family traditions, regional customs, cultural norms. They even have legal components. I mean, there are laws that need to be addressed, administrative rules that need to be reviewed organizational policies that need to be examined and changed. And we have to develop, professionally develop. So leader preference, as, as, as Ron was pointing out, leaders in charge of large institutions change themselves so that they could be the vanguard and, uh, and the, the standard bearer for the change that needs to happen in the, in the organizations. So just remember the three big things I've tried to point out here, and that is truth, Reconciliation and healing is the pathway to get into where Ron wants to be, where we can all value uh, each and every human being that comes into our presence, no matter who they are, from whence they come, or whether they have money or not. Full stop. Wow. Very well said. I really, uh, yeah. Truth, re reconciliation, and healing. I'm writing that down for our notes for this. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Daria, the last time that we, when, when we joined together, you talked about your safety net <laughs> hospital and the, str the financial struggles that safety net hospitals who serve communities of color are, are facing generally in general, but specifically in this uh, COVID situation. How do those hospitals who are already struggling, how do they improve access to resources for, for uh, our disparate population? So um, thank you for the question, Donna. Uh, again, a little complex. Um, you know, by nature, the fact that safety net hospitals are, strive to deliver care to those who are challenged by low income and lack of insurance uh, sort of makes us almost at a disadvantage in trying to render care. But despite those challenges, there are, I think there are ways uh, both on a large scale and smaller scales that we can still try to provide the healthcare resources that patients need. Um, the first thing that I will say is, and it's almost non-medical, but I, I feel like the less financial resources you have as an institution, the more you have to use your voice and the more almost politically active you have to be. So I say that uh, meaning that our hospital leaders have to continue to be vocal about uh, resources and the needs and why we need um, those resources. You know, the, the whole discussion of COVID brought out a lot of uh, talk about disparities. So when we, if you think about the fact that in some instances we're starting with sometimes sicker patients, it would seem almost intuitive that we should have these resources, but that's not always the case. So being vocal um, is one, uh, one uh, answer. Um, the next thing I would say is as institutions, we have to be able to meet people where they are. So the challenges of COVID-19 have made certain um, barriers to access. And so we have to be equipped to transition to telephonic medicine and try to encourage our patients to come along in that journey with us. Uh, some go a little bit more readily than others, but also in that we have to also realize that everyone may not have internet access. And so just being able to render care 
uh, as to the best of the, your ability within certain uh, circumstances, being able to have a telephone conversation, if that's what it takes to at least establish some kind of contact and prevent uh, things from just going haywire uh, or, or really getting out of out of control until they can be in person. Um, also, you know, messaging is very important, I think, at this time. So I, I'm a big advocate of people using social media responsibly. Almost all institutions now have Facebook pages, some have Instagram, LinkedIn, etc. So using those platforms, which um, speak to a lot of people now, um, dinosaurs like me have to accept that you have to get on the social media bandwagon or you'll, you'll kind of be, you'd be dragging behind, but we can use those uh, tools to help us communicate with patients. So um, I think one of the big things that we need to do right now is let our patients know that it's okay to come back to the doctor. Let us let them know that we're available for them. Let them know that this is the time that you want to maintain your follow-up visits. You want to maintain your screening for things like diabetes, for colon cancer, for breast cancer, those things that we put on hold in the midst of our crises, we can't, uh, we can't lose sight of those now because then we might be putting ourselves at risk. Um, I wanna share a really, really quick story um, that exemplifies this. Um, I, during the heart of all of this, I wanna say back in April, I got a call from the emergency room for um, a woman who had come in she had had a small wound uh, February, January, February, got worse, was uh, referred to a consultant, which by the time she got the appointment, we were in the heart of the COVID and the, that camp, that appointment was canceled. So she stayed at home, the leg got worse, more pain, wound got worse. So this poor woman decided not to eat because she thought if she didn't eat, she wouldn't have to get up to go to the bathroom. So then she wouldn't incur more pressure on her leg and that and she stayed at home in that state not eating not drinking for days until things just couldn't go anymore so by the time she actually presented to the emergency room she had a leg that needed to be amputated and she was maybe 80 pounds so i, I share that story um because on one hand we want to sometimes we we right now we're so focused on trying to keep ourselves safe from COVID, that we are not um, doing what we need to do uh, in terms of keeping ourselves safe. Um, the other thing I would say, there, even small things. So for example, in our institution, where patients can't um, get to the hospital or to the medical center for more um, complex care, such as surgeries or diagnostic testing, we're doing what we can to help them with those transportation needs. Um, also, uh, the CDC has talked about the importance of getting flu shots this year more than ever because we all want to avoid the synergistic uh, phenomenon of the flu and COVID. So we're doing things to make uh, getting flu shots and pneumonia vaccines more accessible to our patients. Um, and our patients in particular, some of whom are still dealing with the devastation of, of looting and their local pharmacies that they've come to depend on still haven't reopened from some of the uh, civil unrest and, and looting. And lastly, I would say one of the uh, more powerful things that I think we as institutions can do is uh, celebrate, engage, and educate. August is uh, Civil Health uh, Month, if, for those of you who don't know. Um, and as providers, we're encouraging our patients to register to vote. Um, one way or the other, your health care is dependent on the political regime. Um, no matter which side of the aisle and which philosophy uh, you partake in, health care is a part of what happens in politics. And so we are actually encouraging and also trying to help our patients register to vote, um, sometimes just in discussions as they occur in history taking. Sometimes we're doing it as a part of our social history, and then we are actively uh, assisting patients. We've had in-person groups come in to help patients register to vote while they're waiting for their appointments or while they're waiting to be registered. Um, I'm, I'm a little technologically challenged, so I'll put this up um, just as a demonstration. Uh, this is an organization, Vote ER, 
but I'm, I'm putting it up just for the symbolism so that you can see um, this is a wonderful uh, organization that was started by Dr. Alistair Williams and Mass at Mass General and basically it provides a QR code that patients can just scan and that shoots them directly uh, to a mechanism where they can register to vote. Um, you, we have to vote like our health depends on it because it does and I'll leave it at that. Wow I had no idea that uh, that it was Civil Health Month in the, uh, this month. So thank you so much. We will be sure to, to share that on our social media as well. Thank you. Um, Pat, a question for you. Uh, we have several patient advocates that are on uh, in our network and also on the line today. I wonder if you could share with us, what can patient advocates do to help improve healthcare equity? I I, I think that's a great issue, and I, I really have to applaud uh, the prior speakers for their informative uh, discussion as well as their powerful messages, so, so thank you. In terms of patient advocates, I'd like to propose something a little bit different, is we all need to be patient advocates. If we're, if we're in a setting or we need to have caregivers that are our advocates. So, so again, patient advocates doesn't mean just a formal organization. It's everyone can be an advocate for themselves and oftentimes they need to be. And certainly that's where caregivers also are of great assistance. And then there's the formal ones that uh, sometimes can work on behalf of patients. And there are the sometimes not-for-profit organizations or for-profit organizations where you have to pay a fee uh, to, to get some advocacy. And then there's the focus area ones, whether it's disease-based or location-based. Uh, there are many different organizations out there. And I just wanna talk about two, two streams because if you're in immediate jeopardy, what we call immediate jeopardy or immediate harm, you take different actions than you will for something that may be longer term. And when I say immediate, that means that um, you're, you're in the hospital or you're in the nursing home or you have a loved one and they need um, some change to occur. Well, first you wanna try and speak to the caregivers have somebody speak to the caregiver, see if you can change their mind. If not, uh, you wanna go to the hospital patient representative or you wanna go in a nursing home to the ombudsman, which is located outside of that uh, nursing home and is supposed to work on behalf of the resident. And then if you don't get anywhere there, um, if you're a Medicare beneficiary, you can contact the, uh, the BFCC, the Beneficiary and Family Centered Care quality improvement organization, and they actually respond. They respond well, and they will advocate for you, whether it's hospital or nursing home or outside of uh, those settings as well. And then you can also contact public health, but oftentimes you may get um, not immediate assistance. Depending upon the state you're in, they all function differently. And then the other option is, if you're not getting satisfaction along those ways, uh, take to social media, uh, because it really does have an impact. So those are for the immediate issues. And I'll tell you right now, during this uh, COVID-19 time, people are taking to media. They are trying to find solutions because um, again, care in some settings is not the best. And if we had disparities before, they're only being accentuated uh, by, by what's going on right now uh, with COVID-19. So again, the disparities are just widening. They're not closing. They're in, they're in full blown view of everyone. For a longer term approach, I would say, you know, you can get involved with the patient family advisory council within a hospital setting. That's an opportunity to voice your issues and concerns. You can also get involved in a uh, nursing home, a resident council or family council. And everyone has to have a resident or resident family council. Now, sometimes they're not open, uh, you know, in terms of their discussions, but some are. So again, you have to at least try that route. Community leaders, people in the community, you know, if there's disparities occurring and you're being treated 
and justly, then you need to also look at, are there community organizations that are also rallying behind that issue? And we see that in Chicago oftentimes. You can also join with some of the organizations that are out there, whether it's a disease-based or even the, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. Uh, there's many organizations. The other thing is approach elected officials. And sometimes it's not so much the official. You can write a letter there. It may be their staff and raise the issues because elected officials and their staff actually do respond. Um, and a, you have to be very, you know, um, share your story and be willing to uh, share it otherwise. The other route is journalists. Um, I just picked up an article, somebody sent it to me, and it's the most insightful article on what went on at the Kirkland Nursing Home. And and the harm, and from a, a resident perspective, a caregiver perspective, clinician perspective, just the, the chaos that was going on and how people were calling out for help. And then, of course, um, you know, it's, you can go to your state public health, but right now they seem to be overwhelmed with everything going on. Uh, so again, I would try the other avenues uh, first. And, but the idea is, not just to let it occur, but to be proactive and know it's okay. I, I think we all, as I hate the word patience because it impri implies you're supposed to be patient, <laughs> not, not do anything. We'll take care of you. Uh, you don't have to uh, voice your concerns. And we need to change that around so that people all feel they have a voice and they should have their voice respected. And we have to address the health and equity issues because they are really driving up the costs of care because we're not providing the proper care at the beginning. So with that, again, I hope I encouraged everyone to be a patient or caregiver advocate uh, because that's the only way and not give up when you, the door closes on you, but just uh, find another door to go through. Thank you. Wow. Yes, very well said, Pat. We are, we all do have to be our own patient advocate and I, great suggestions for all of us. Thank you so much. Uh, Ron, question actually from the audience for you. Um, someone who commented that they were very sorry to hear about your brother's experience and, um, but curious to know about the social history assessment that was done when he was admitted to the hospital. Um, you know, a lot, very often that's the one and only time that we gather the kind of information that you were saying that people didn't know about your brother. Um, can you just talk about, uh, about that process and um, what, what happened with your brother there and what can organizations do better in their social assessment? Uh, sure. So and I, and I thank you for the question. And I alluded to that a bit. Um, there was very little known about him as a person. Um, that, that inquiry wasn't made. And, and I think what's really important in healthcare, whether it's inpatient or outpatient, uh, whether it's face-to-face -face or, or uh, telemedicine, that it is a person uh, who has a life, and has a family, uh, and is a part of this society. So that there was little or no evidence that any of that uh, took place. Uh, a person comes into an ICU with septic shock and, and they get IV fluids and levofed and, and all those things there's a person there. Um, so no, those aspects about his, his social background, and that's why I brought some of that in, the kind of person that he is, uh, is important. And that's for, for anyone who, who comes into healthcare and is looking for empathy and looking to trust what's about to happen to them. I think a big part of what healthcare can, can do is not, it, it's just not complicated calculus. And you know, I go to uh, Dr. Venable, who is just this wonderful person that I met years ago when I was leaving training in St. Louis. Dr. Venable was over 90 years old and still practiced medicine in St. Louis. And he, he gave me a few lessons about this that I still think apply to all of us, whether you're a physician, nurse, or advocate, whoever it is. He, he said, when a person comes to see you, keep your mouth shut and listen. And they're going to tell you who they are. They're going to tell you what's important to them. They're going to tell you what matters to them. And he said, over 9% of the time, 
they're going to tell you what's wrong with them. And then all you need to do is come up with some of those big medical words that you learned in medical school and repeat them back. And he said, first, they're going to think you're the smartest doctor I ever met. So they're going to go tell the whole community, you know, that's a smart doctor. He, he knew exactly what was wrong with me. Uh, but it came down to just humility. And, and somewhere we've lost humility in, in healthcare delivery, inpatient, outpatient. Again, I go back, you got to have humility on a telemedicine visit. Um, so we have to practice humility, structural humility, cultural humility. Listen, listen to people, ask questions, ask their permission to, to enter into their lives. Tell me about your life. Uh, and, and this is not something new for me, when, when, even when I was in academic medicine teaching medical students, when they want to say, well, this is a 58-year-old black female, yada, yada, yada. I abolished using 58-year-old black female over 20 years ago. I, I would say to medical students and residents, tell me about the person in the room. And it was one, in some cases, it was a simple question. Give me three things that are sitting on their nightstand in that hospital room. Tell me that there's some sign of life. Is, are there paintings from grandkids or family members or friends? Are there flowers? What is in that room that tells you this is a person in front of you that has a life outside of these four walls? And if there is nothing, if there are no flowers, if there are no signs, if there is no get well soon, grandma, that's still telling you something. If there's something there that you need to understand, this person may be lacking social support. What, what is going on in that other dynamic that we need to know about? So, you know, I just say empathy, love, compassion, respect, humility. You know, and I, and I, I always use the term from Chen Kibi, who wrote Things Fall Apart, and, and, and I paraphrase it. You can't come to, into my house through your gate. You have to come through my gate. I need to tell you about my gate and my yard and my house and what it means to me. And then I'll give you permission and we can sit at my table and we can have a conversation and we can get to know each other and we can co-produce your health care and you can own it. Take away this paternalistic approach that, that uh, hit me in the face with my brother when that physician said, you know, these folk come in. He's already made a decision about people whatever that meant. So, so that's, we got to back away from that and, and enter into a different kind of partnership where, where people take control of, of their health care. People understand the resource available. Is there a patient family advisory council? Uh, you know, I have the right to ask for a pharmacist to, to, to talk to me about my medications, inpatient, outpatient, about my diet, about me. Get to know me. And then we can get healthier together. And, and, and that's, you know, I think, the things that we need to go to before we can get to then clinical decisions and the bias involved in clinical decisions. And, and you know, we can talk about that if we have time. But those are the basics of it that we need, to, we need to understand and get back to and admit that in large part, inpatient, outpatient, um, we have lost if we ever had it. So we need to focus on regaining what, what's been lost. Absolutely. Well, and, and it sounds like it sounds like what you're suggesting is that we go back to the way we used to think about assessments before they became checkboxes in an EHR. So, um, and thank you so much for re reminding us that humility in healthcare is is a key in order for us to understand others. Um, Marcus, I wonder if you could, um, and, and, and I just wanted to, to note to everyone, we are about six minutes away from the hour, but because we did get started late. Um, if, if anybody has to jump off, I completely understand. But if, if we could kind of go until 10 after the hour to get everybody the full one hour of contact hour credit that we, that we uh, are offering today, that would be fabulous. Um, Marcus, um, can you, you know, both Pat and Daria talked about the importance of getting involved, talking with politicians, voting, um, and, and, and such. What, what, how do we incentivize local governments to uh, to better improve healthcare access. Again, with those marvelously beautiful, complex questions. Uh, thank you so much, Donna. You must think a lot of me. I'll take I'll take that as a as a as, 
I think that's absolutely I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 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 it boils. So I'm I'm gonna follow uh, Ron's. Uh, uh, I'm gonna follow everybody because they've they've been with so decisive in their answer. So I'm just gonna get right to it. In Western society, specifically the United States of America, no matter what town you're in, is incentive. It's all about the money. It's all about the money. And here's where I come at that. Oppression costs way too much with little or no actual ROI for the oppression. I mean, it's just not a good deal. Uh, there is a business case for resolving these oppressions of racism, sexism, classism, other isms, however you define them. There is a business case for solving that. Uh, when, when communities and government lower the overall uh, cost of effective, efficient governance, we all win financially. You know, we all win by paying less tax, lower insurance premiums, better outcomes. Oh, my goodness, what could be better than that? You know, uh, so solving the oppression riddle that drives disparity actually reduces taxes, increases societal uh, uh, level engagement, productivity. You know, if we're healthier, we perform better, and so we can earn more. I mean, it's it's, a, it's in a balanced scorecard kind of way, uh, we could do a lot better job for ourselves, and, and that's the real incentive. So getting smarter about the economic equations that drive what I would call human capital value add. So like, it's not just, it, so that human being that has a life and, and has family and people or no life and family and people, there is a capacity for economic value add sitting right there. There is a human capital ROI that can be established for nonprofit and for-profit agencies, organizations that, that will drive their efforts to reduce the impact of their touch on the oppression will. So bigger oppression is like a huge societal boulder that all of us have our hands on and we're all pushing it one way or the other. If we could just get one hand off the boulder, that means it pushes a little, little, you know, it rolls over fewer people. If we can get both hands off, it might even stop kind of thing. So getting smart about these uh, uh, occasions uh, can be uh, a bit uh, about, about the human piece of it, the money piece of it uh, will lead to better outcomes across the board. Uh, uh, um, in the human endeavor. So here's a, here's a quick story about this. So when I first came to Chicago six years ago, I decided I was going to come be a part of the, the, the solution uh, around the gun violence thing. So I did my own little, little research on the thing, my little back of the napkin calculation. Like, what does this thing cost the Illinois, Cook County, city of uh, Chicago? And all told, uh, the way I rolled it up, it was about three, three and a half billion dollars a year for gun violence alone. Three and a half billion dollars a year. Now, if you and I got together with all of our institutions and all of the, you know, all of our partners and 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 uh, and you know the public health departments and all of their partners in housing, economic development, all these other things that drive at the underlying stressors that are that are the source of the the, uh, the disparities, and if we and if we only did a, a what I would call, excuse my language, a half-ass job. That means it would go down by 50%, right? Well, what is a 50% reduction in that? Well, that's a $1.5 billion savings year on year for Cook County, for city of Chicago, and uh, the, the state of Michigan, I'm sorry, state of Illinois. And guess what? If, if those were sustainable uh, cost savings, with responsible um, leadership, that would be passed on as lower tax burden to you and me. It's all about the money. And if we could see the business case for eradicating racism, the business case for eradicating genderism, the you know, for sexism, we all be wealthier and healthier because we did. Full stop. Thank you, Marcus. I knew you were the right person to ask that question of, as complex as it was. <laughs> that's a perfect answer. Thank you. Um, um, Daria, I, 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 there's, we got about 10 minutes left. I have about three more questions I'd like to get to. So um, 
So I'll ask you another complex question, but ask you if you could keep it brief for me. Um, you know, it, it, kind of playing on what, what Marcus just said, we, we really need data to be able to establish a business case for this. So what role, uh, what role um, does data play in healthcare organizations and how can they better use the data that they have to address disparities? So I'm gonna try to keep this brief, but I, I'd like to answer your question about using data uh, with one of my favorite quotes um, that I don't think people apply to healthcare. But Dr. Martin Luther King said, nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. And I, that is my driving force in how I practice medicine. How I interpret that is, as a, as a clinician, if we don't understand that, or we, we're not aware of the increased incidences of or maternal Eternal mortality in Chicago, for example, that Chicago actually has the highest rate of, of deaths related to uh, childbirth. If I don't understand the side effects that certain African American uh, patients have with certain antihypertensive drugs, that's sincere ignorance. If I don't understand that racial and ethnic uh, minority females are more likely than white women to present with uh, breast cancer at later stages, that's sincere ignorance. If I have the data, I, I have to have the data first and I have, to, I have to familiarize myself with it. And once we have the data and all these discussions of COVID has brought out you know, all these discussions about health disparities and how people of color are affected. Now, if we don't use the data correctly, that's the conscientious stupidity. If uh, Ron gave us examples, uh, uh, countless examples, so I won't, I won't, I'll, I won't dwell on that. But if we if we don't look at our diabetic patients, for example, and we chastise them, why aren't you why aren't you uh, checking your sugars? But we're not paying attention to the fact that they were sent lancets, but their insurance companies have not given them a glucose meter or they've called five times trying to get a glucose meter. Or if I'm talking to them about their diet and why aren't you eating a healthy diet, but I don't appreciate that they have food insecurity, then that's conscientious stupidity. I'm practicing medicine without, as Ron told us, thinking about them as a person. So what I would, I would recommend or, or how I see this uh, we have to do some basic things. I'm not going to go into how we need to listen to our patients because I think Ron has driven that point home. That's like the assist from Magic Johnson. And now that, you know, we've got the slam dunk. I would say we have to, as entities, we need to use social workers and community health workers to help us gauge what patients need things and, and, and use those individuals to help us try to link them to the resources that we need. We have to look at this uh, healthcare disparities within the context of social determinants of health. So we as an institution need to play a part in trying to solve uh, burdens of food insecurity. We're, when we do contact tracing, we're asking patients, okay, we told you to shelter in place. Do you have meals? And so if, we, if they don't have meals, we partner with some local community partners in the uh, food depository to bring them meals so that they can safely eat and shelter in place. We need to look at uh, health literacy. Um, I think that's a, a huge, huge vacuum uh, and where a lot more attention is needed because if we expect patients to be partners, we also have to be partners in helping them navigate the medical system. We need to have robust, comprehensive programming that includes looking at uh, social disparities and things that have been identified, including mental health. And, and lastly, I would say um, we need to, again, listen to the community, listen to our patients. Uh, we, we conduct uh, community needs assessments here at our hospital every three years, and we look at that data um, and use that data along with all that we know about specific uh, comorbidities to gauge programming to, to help guide us to know which programs. Do we need to implement comprehensive diabetes? Do we need to implement eye screening? Do we need to implement STD programming? So we've used the community needs assessment as well as the data from entities such as the CDC and, and other uh, medical entities to help guide our programming. If we don't use the data, we're practicing dangerous medicine, in my opinion, as Dr. King warned us against doing. 
Wow. This has been such a fabulous, fabulous panel discussion. I do, I do have um, a quick question for Pat. Uh, you know, Daria mentioned the importance of health literacy. It, you know, we also have language barriers in our communities. What can be done to improve this so that, so that hospitals can do a better job? I, first of all, I, there's a study that came out from CMS and uh, asked the healthcare providers how many of their patients have uh, difficulty with language or literacy, and they said 60% of all the patients. So again, we're talking about almost everyone <laughs> has, has a, a barrier. When it comes to language, healthcare providers are required to provide a, a language line if the patient expresses, and they have to ask the question, what is your preferred language? Because many people are bilingual, but they tend to prefer one language over another. So they have to ask that question. And then second, they have to provide them with access to, if it's a different language than what the provider speaks, they have to provide that service either within the, if it's in a hospital or a nursing home, or they've got to use the language line. Because again, that, that has to be offered. They have to be, it's, it's a requirement. So, and if they don't, you can always contact within each region uh, around the United States. There's the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights and you can file a complaint. And they do follow up. This is a very serious violation by a provider. So that's language. Now you come to health literacy, and, and it's not just literacy, it's health literacy. And that's where many people don't um, understand their condition or it's not explained to them. And, and that's where the opportunities to improve care occur, is when, you, when a patient is asked if they understand this, and not in a threatening way or a demeaning way, because we've got to get away from the demeaning of patients, and ask them if they understand. And, and also, as, as Ron was saying, listen to the patients. I always, you know, we hear about teach back, having the patients say, what they thought they heard were the instructions for care, but it's also, I call it bi-directional. Are we listening to the patient? Really listening to them. And, and just to give you an idea, health literacy changes. And I have a, I have a very close friend that is a well-known physician, uh, top of the line, international researcher and lecturer. And he, um, for kidney disease, but he now has a new disease. He's got a um, esophageal cancer and he knew nothing about it. And so he's had to listen to the others and learn from them. And he, even though he was an expert in his field, he did not understand his, his needs as well as the treatment and options that he has available. So we all, even if you're, the most prolific you know, uh, physician around, you need assistance in understanding your condition. And it's, it's very common when somebody has a chronic disease, their disease may progress. And so their needs for more information, different information occurs. But we always need to be asking at the beginning of a session, do you understand, do you, it's called the confidence tool, do you understand your condition? Uh, are we explaining it so that you can understand it? And then at the end, asking those same questions because the conversation may have changed. And again, it's, it's a way of really doing fast track improvement is just by listening to the patient and asking them questions in a non-threatening way, making them feel comfortable that they can say, I really don't understand. So, so health literacy goes a long way in improving outcomes, keeping the patients safe because they understand their, their course of treatment. And then language is just essential to care. I mean, there's no other way around it. It's essential care. Absolutely.
Thank you. Uh, Ron, last question is to you. I wonder if you could wrap up this session by addressing a, a question that somebody had from the audience about how to define disparities in patient safety um, and, uh, and, and commented that this is the first time this person who works in patient safety has heard this term. <clears throat> so I wonder if you could end the session just by um, commenting on that and your thoughts about what patient safety professionals uh, need to know and, and, and how do we help, it, help people for this not to be their first time hearing it. Yeah, so, so you know, I, I summarize patient safety as no one should be hurt or harmed in the process of receiving health and health care. That's what patient safety is. So if we just go to the, to the inpatient side of it, then that means we have to look at things like um, hospital-acquired pressure ulcer, falls with injury, uh, surgical site infections, uh, we have to look at things like readmission rates and why people are readmitted. So on the hospital side, you can begin to look at those, and that's the data part of it, uh, because all of those are harms. On the outpatient side of it, uh, the, the whole access issue, but it's more than access. It's what happens once I gain access uh, at, the, at the reception desk. If I don't speak English as a first language, is there a person there that speaks my language? That's a patient safety issue. Right, because what we found when I was at the Joint Commission and still to this day is one of the biggest root causes of failure is failures in communication. So if, so if you uh, are working in a community where you know that the, the first language of most of the people in that community is not English, but if when they walk in, uh, no one speaks that language, that's a major patient safety failure. When that person calls in for an appointment, likewise, that's a major patient safety failure. When a person sits in front of uh, a clinician where decisions are being made. Is the, is the clinician listening or are they spending most of their time in front of the computer typing in some words? That's, that's where failures in communication and clinical decisions are made that hurt people. So it's inpatient and outpatient. So look at what the, look at what the data is telling you. Is your race and ethnicity and language data accurate, valid, robust, measurable, and actionable? When you look at the outcomes of what your care, are you measuring them? Do you know that for every person that comes in, that evidence-based best practice is being implemented? Uh, and, and, and you can measure that. Uh, and so look at those things. Are you incentivizing reductions in, in harm? Uh, are you looking at, and I think probably the top uh, uh, patient safety issue in inpatient, outpatient settings are medication errors. Uh, so, so look at the medication error rate. These are valid numbers, and they'll tell you something about where those errors are being made, and you dig underneath that to say, how can we make our system safer just around medication error? So those are just some examples, but I'll, I'll sum it up again by saying no one should be hurt uh, uh, and that's preventable in the process of receiving health and health care. That is patient safety. That is zero harm. There's no substitute for it. There's no compromise about it. There's no negotiating it. And I think at every level of health healthcare, we have to say to people that the aim, the goal is zero harm. Wow, absolutely. Thank you so much, Ron. Marcus, Pat, Daria, this has been a phenomenal discussion. We've got lots of comments from the audience uh, about uh, about how much they really appreciate everything that you've spoken about today. This is of course being recorded as are all of our, our sessions and we are providing uh, continuing education credit for physicians, nurses, and pharmacists. Um, so there, there, we also have a question from the audience about uh, contact information. Um, to our panelists, uh, if, oh, perfect, <laughs> excellent. So Ron has already answered that question. If anybody else has, uh, has contact information to share, if you would share it in the chat for, so that folks can reach out and ask questions, then that is wonderful. Well, this again, this is part two, but definitely not the end of this conversation, I am sure. So I appreciate your time and you all so very much, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.